If you want to grow your business, you need to listen to this episode. Today, we speak to Nick Crawford. Nick explains how to master the only marketing channel your audience has to opt into, email marketing. In this episode, Nick walks us through the entire spectrum from starting from zero through to the best practices and how to optimize your campaign. Nick even walks us through how he grew Travelodge's email revenue 100% year on year. We hope you enjoy this episode. Email is easy. Great email isn't. What makes great email marketing? So it depends on, I'd say you've got two views on this. You've got the consumer view and then you've got the business view. So from a consumer's point of view, I would say that everyone has probably four or five brands that actually they do quite look forward to those emails coming through, either because they're really useful, they're educating them in some way, and mainly because they entertain them in some way as well. So it either makes them emotionally feel something, makes them laugh. Probably about 5% of your inbox that's like that. The other 95% has to vie for your attention. It has to just get the timing right and or there's something about it that just strikes you. So a great email is that 5%. It's the part that educates, informs, entertains as a consumer. I want to read this and I look forward to it. From a business point of view, it's about more... Um, how do I show that I'm progressing? How do I show that my email is uh, continually growing rather than declining? And so that's looking at your metrics, your year on year, the amount of traffic you're getting, your success metrics, whatever they are, and actually showing that they're um, improving rather than declining. Typically, what would those success metrics be? So they would typically be, um, so once upon a time it used to be open. Uh, I think there's a general consensus now that that is, uh, it's useful, but it's not the thing that you should hang your hat on from a success. Mm. Just because somebody's uh, looked at something doesn't mean they've acted on it. Um, so from an email engagement point of view, click typically is the key metric because they've interacted with the email in some way. And then you've got your commercial success metrics, which will be more business specific. So actually, did they convert off it? Did you get some revenue of it? Did they attend? Did they download? Whatever that the purpose of that email is um, linked into the that kind of success. Yeah, and I like the the angle of like great email is different from two different viewpoints, right? So obviously from from our podcast, the answer to that is very much be the second part, right? So like commercially, what does that that look like? But I think the only way you can achieve the commercial good stuff, if you like, is by really doing the first part really well, right? Like how do you appeal to your audience it's interesting i was listening to a podcast that george put me onto actually this morning um what's it called sweat equity i think the podcast is and they were talking about how great marketing in general and i think it's really applicable to email is it's a bit like a tv show like with a tv show you know what to expect right so you're going to tune back in every week whether it's going to be five part series 12 part series or like you know coronation streets we're going on for forever but you know what to expect right and i think that's from an email perspective probably similar which is if people are looking forward to those like five brands or whatever my take on that or understanding would be it's because they know what they're going to expect from that brand in terms of what those emails are going to be about yeah absolutely and it's i'm a great advocate that email is not about the thing that you're just about to open email is a long-term strategy piece so you have to look at your email in that yearly view um both across your subscriber engagement, but also about the mix of content that you have, the approach that you take, it feeds into everything. Um, so I, uh, one, of the, one of my 5% is uh, Uni, the pizza makers. Um, they're not cheap kind of pizza ovens, they're you know, top of the range, they're a few hundred pounds, you're only gonna get one of those every kind of 10 years or something. So how do you then start to have a continuous email you know, newsletter or stream when the purchase is completed. And they, what they do is they have this real great sense of community. So they do things like kind of recipes, events. They're very hot on their merch. And if you're into the brand, you're into the brand. So you want, you know, the cap, the apron, the accoutrement that goes with it. Um, so I still absolutely religiously wait for their emails, open their emails to see what they're going to tell me this time. And that for me is, is what greatness is about. It's that width of content. It's understanding and um, talking to your audience, your subscribers, your community, and harvesting that relationship over time. And I guess that comes back to the success metrics that you were talking about in the sense of there will be some emails that you want to generate, well, I guess, base success on 
the financial outcomes, right? Some emails are just particularly generated to drive sales, but not all of them should be. And I think that's where, like, I have seen in the past things fall down, is if you're basing every email that you send, the success of that email on commercially, what revenue is that driven? You're only ever thinking in the short term. And what you're saying there is, it's a long-term play. And if it's a long-term play, not every email should be measured on the same outcomes. No, absolutely. So each email should be measured on what it's trying to achieve. So one of the key considerations when you're planning your emails is what's the objective of this email. Um, that then means that you then um, can measure the success based on actually what it's trying to achieve. So sometimes it might be just read. Sometimes it might be you know length of time on email. Sometimes it will be on click, sometimes it will be on conversion. So understanding that. The analogy that I use is um, it's a bit like talking to a friend. If you meet up with a friend and they always talk about the same things, normally about themselves, at some point you're going to get slightly bored with that and actually you won't really want to kind of meet up with them. Great friendship is where you've got a myriad of conversations where you cover a width of topics where it makes you laugh, it makes you cry, it kind of challenges you, makes you think those great conversations let's do that in email as well over time and create that conversation create that relationship yeah, that's why we didn't invite brennan today just right saying, just, just goes on and on uh, but let's set the scene a little bit so a lot of our audience are very much in that first or second year so they've most likely survived the first year now looking to really accelerate growth and they're going to be looking at which channels are best suited to, to drive that growth obviously if you've survived your first year you're most likely going to have at least an existing database of, of customers. But let's assume we're starting from zero when it comes to email marketing. So we have a CRM of sorts with, with customers, most likely going to be a spreadsheet if we're in our first year. Um, where do we start if we're starting from zero? So the first consideration is, do I need email? Now, I love email. Obviously, I've spent a lot of time in the email industry. But email is not always the right channel. And I'm a great believer that uh, nothing works in isolation. So you have to look at your marketing mix as a whole and you have to look at what you're trying to achieve. So start with the business goals. Am I looking to uh, find a new audience? Email is not necessarily going to be the best choice for you. Your broadcast, your PR channels are the things to lean into at that point. But capture the data. As you said, everyone will start with some kind of CRM. And at some point, you will have enough volume where you go, I've now got an audience that I can start to talk to regularly. And the ambition absolutely should be that you've got your first party data, that data that you own yourself, that you can then control and you can directly talk to your prospects and your customers on a regular basis. So once you reach the point of going, actually, I'm now starting to grow my data, that's where email really kind of kicks in. Um, so the first things are what sort of messaging, what sort of frequency, um, and that's a mixture of time, balance, resource, and outcome. So, you know, like all channels, it takes time and effort to, to put good content together. Um, so most businesses start with some kind of newsletter, some kind of regular send, which also allows you to then um, talk about lots of different things. So. Um, there is a question mark over it, you know, are newsletters worthwhile or not? I happen to believe that they're a really good way of showcasing lots of different areas of your business so that people can understand not only who you are, but the width of services that you typically offer. Um, I've got a colleague of mine who refers to them as the Harry Potter sorting hat of uh, the email world because newsletters let you have this little snippet from each of kind of those key areas. Um, and then... Um, I would say start to look at the life stage of each of your uh, prospects and your customers. So you won't necessarily want to say the same thing to everyone. That's kind of marketing 101. That's coming to your segmentation, your kind of relevance. So start to say, okay, so my prospects, what do they need to know? I've got a prospect send. My customers, um, are they first time, are they single use customers the first time or are they multi use? And actually, have I got a slightly different message that I want to give to them? And then that starts to just lead into your life cycle marketing, where you can be a bit more tailored and you can then start to decide, um, actually, is it a dedicated send at certain times? So it might be promotionally based because, as we said, email does convert. Or actually, is it more of a branding piece that says you've been with me for six months or a year? Here's what's changed. Here's a reminder of why you came to us in the first place. Here's what makes us different and and different. And you can start to then 
and maintain that relationship. We'll get back to this episode in a minute, but right now I want to talk to you about the business we're building, 1225. We get it. SEO has a reputational problem. That's why we believe in stripping things back to basics and driving real results for your business. At 1225, we're the audience first SEO agency. We believe in centering our content around your audience's pain points and opportunities. That's why we're more than just an SEO agency. We produce video, we produce social media content, and we even produce written content to help drive results for your business. Look, here's the dream scenario. You're going to press pause, you're going to go to the description, drop me an email, then you're going to come back, press play, and we're going to get back to the episode. Let me give you a two-part follow-up. So one of the things we had in the prep doc was that exact question on, on newsletters. So I would probably sit personally on the other side of that that like i think very few businesses should have a have a newsletter um i can go into it separately but so in your opinion yet yeah, for most people newsletter good thing follow up to that would be what makes a great newsletter so um two two kind of key considerations for me one is um the newsletter allows you to make your customers and your prospects aware of the full range of services that you have. So if somebody comes in and buys a product, so let's say you uh, 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 are a PC manufacturer, they buy a particular product from you. If you only talk about that product from then on, actually you're potentially missing a trick in terms of actually here's the support services that we have, here's the other problems that our users have, Here's uh, what's happening in the home PC market. So that that breadth. So in the same way that you would look at podcasts, in the same way that you would do your industry research, the same way as a consumer you would go, you know, coming back to my pizza example, what's the next great menu pizza that I can create? That for me is the place that the newsletter has because it brings all of that information you'd have on your blogs, on your websites, across your social user generated content and allows you to curate that and put that in front of people who won't necessarily have seen that. So it's a really good supporting mechanism to repurpose all of that content and make sure it's seen. It doesn't then mean that you have to be vanilla to everyone. So actually, you can get smart with your newsletters. And again, using um, segmentation and using that uh, understanding of your audience can then start to say, okay, well, actually, I know they're a first-time user. So my lead article for them will be this, whereas for a somebody who's been with you for two or three years, actually I might want to lead with something different. So you can start to personalize your newsletter to make it as relevant as possible, but it's still doing that uh, broadcast job for your business. Hmm. So how do you take something from good to great? Is it that segmentation, do you think? Yeah, I, th- I think so. So, it, so most businesses will start with everything to everyone because that's the easiest place to start. Um, so there is uh, a sense of email maturity. And actually, if you uh, Google email maturity map, you'll find a number of lovely diagrams to kind of look at. But effectively, it starts to go everything to everyone, which is most people's starting point. Then you start to move into um, a campaign and newsletter. So you have more targeted sends based on early segmentation. And then you start to move into your life stage. Actually, I've got a welcome journey and a nurture journey and a first purchase journey and you start to develop that way and then finally you move into more uh, propensity and behavioral so actually I can recognize what you've seen on the website I can then send you content or a trigger that's based on that I can recognize that you're starting to lapse and I can do something different with you that way so you take that those principles of segmentation and you apply it to your email mechanisms uh, as you develop and grow and mature mm. so let's talk about the data or like in reality customers like i think like it's it's dangerous to just refer to it as data because you forget it forget it's people um we're both business owners um a lot of the people well, everyone listening is, is is a business owner in some capacity and because of that we're all incredibly impatient right like most of us want growth and we want it now and if we're not getting that growth we can get quite, quite frustrated and especially with those longer term plays. Like we see it as an SEO agency. We know that it's going to take a period of time. Yes, we'll do our best to, to fast track it, but it's a, it's a medium to long term play. And most business owners that we're working with, we understand how that impatience can grow. It's the same for email, right? Let's put 1225 in perspective. So between our clients and then say like the building podcast guests that we've had, probably about 100 people that would sit in some kind of database that we, we could outreach, but that's not a lot of people. So there could be a temptation there to 
bypass that brand building stage and just go buy a list of customers? Should people go and do that? So um, it depends on the type of business you've got. So if you're, so there's, there's a mixture of um, what can I do? Uh, what should I do? And what's legal to do? That's probably your three considerations. So from a compliance uh, point of view, um, everyone will be aware of GDPR, uh, at least in terms of its kind of principles of data transparency. What am I collecting? How am I collecting it? What am I going to use it for? Sitting alongside that for digital mass uh, uh, communications is a regulation called the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulation, known as PECA. And effectively, what that says is, do I have the permission to send uh, digital marketing to you? And that covers uh, email, SMS, uh, automated telephony, uh, and fax, because that's how long that um, legislation has been in place. Um, so it was going to be replaced by the e-privacy law. That uh, has kind of just been, uh, with our general election coming through, has kind of been suspended at the moment. So this this is the part that you have to take into place. So for anyone who's dealing with consumers or um, sole traders, that's where you have to have explicit permission to collect and to send an email. For anyone who's dealing with limited companies or business or corporations, um, it's based on an opt-out rather than opt-in. So actually you can send to, but you have to allow people to opt out of that. So list buying for that group is still possible. Absolutely not possible if you've got a consumer or sole trader audience. And some people have a mixture of corporate and sole trader, so it gets a bit more complicated for them. Um, what I would say is that um, I typically don't see a lot of success with cold list purchase blast so again we are all consumers and every business person will receive a load of emails that they completely ignore and that's because there's no relationship there there's no relevance built in there's no value built in so just that comes under the just because you can should you but what you can do is start to try and accelerate your list growth so you've got a wider audience quicker by things like um, affiliate partnerships so if you've got another business and another brand that has an overlap with your profile, your key uh, client, then actually use their data. They send it out on your behalf, but with an offer or promotion or a piece like that, or run with kind of competitions. Again, um, the watch out for competitions, you'll get a great sign up from it, but actually you've got no relationship in place. So you need to then put in a nurture, a welcome piece that says, thanks for that. Actually, this is who we are. This is what we do to kind of maintain that relationship. So I think there are ways that you can accelerate it, but there are, you know, the quickest wins are, will take time and effort. And again, because we're all consumers, just take that moment to go, would I respond to this? Yeah, that's the thing. We all, we all kind of flick through our inbox. We all ignore a load of it. And then we get into the office, put our marketers, sales managers, mm. business owners hat on and go, I'm going to tell a load of people about me and then wonder why it doesn't work. Yeah, there's a really good follow up to to that in a second. But yeah, I agree on the on the cold list side of things. So one of the things that we have been doing at twelve twenty five is we have quite a uh, robust, I'd say, inbound funnel at the minute in terms of the content we're generating. Then where does that go? And then ultimately, how does it end up as a potential client? But we were like, we don't have a great outbound flow at all at the moment. So we like, could we potentially go do some cold email through an agency or something like that? And the benchmark return rates are crazy. It's something like the industry standard seems to be we're going to send 4,000 emails a month, um, cold to, like, say, businesses. Um, and the positive reply rate, so not even a yes, just not a no, is something like 0.6%. So, yeah, if you have to do it at such scale before that becomes even remotely positive for you. And like I say, if you're a small business, year one, year two of business, the time that that's going to take, you're probably not going to see too much of a as a, a result on and then the second part of what you're talking about there is you need to i really like the benchmark of would you consume this to yourself i think that gets missed a lot it's a conversation that george and i have quite a lot when we're doing our personal brand is like we could put this piece of content out but like do we find it valuable and if we don't we probably shouldn't be posting it but if we if we put ourselves in the shoes of starting from zero you want to do some email marketing, you have a list that's going to enable you to have some success. How do you go about creating content? 
So that's a, that's a, that's a question bigger than email in itself. Um, and it, the, one of the conversations that I often have is that somebody will go, oh, my email's not really working or I don't know what to send. And as soon as you start that conversation, actually, it's a business conversation. It's not, it's a, or a marketing conversation rather than a, a channel specific conversation. Because you'd have the same, you know, I don't know what to post on my socials. I don't know what to put on LinkedIn. It's the same consideration. So I would always say go back to your kind of marketing basics on that. So who is your audience? What are the things that they care about? What are their pain points? What are their joys? Know your audience first. Put that list together. Be able to articulate that. Be clear about that. Use things like your life stage marketing. So actually what would a prospect want to know versus somebody who's first used you versus somebody who's used you multiple times versus somebody who's now not using you why have they stopped using you look at your brand what differentiates you why did somebody want to do business with you put all of that into the mix and then may and then um i quite like using this sense of uh content pillars so not pillar in terms of kind of one big piece that you kind of break down into many but actually having four or five areas that you know that you want to talk about over time so absolutely kind of sales promotion product but then it'll be um you know sense of community potentially what are the you know how can we help and share there might be um behind the scenes and more of the kind of brand pieces so again what that allows you to do is when you're starting to plan out your content plan so which is the next step actually starting to actually put um names and details into the boxes and the plan is to go actually have i found that um 90% 90% of what I'm doing is all sales or all tell. And actually, how do I then make sure that I've kind of I've got a mix in that? Um, and one of the things that you can do is start to look at what's worked and what hasn't worked. Uh, find that and, and lean into the things that are working. Do that review of how much am I telling and how much am I kind of sharing and giving. So there's a bit of a review you can do that way. Um, and then in terms of actually putting the content together, I quite like the no think, feel, do model. I don't know if you've come across that. So effectively breaking down your content planning into what does my audience already know and then what do I want them to know after they've read this? How do I want them to think uh, or what do I want them to think about once they're kind of reading this? How is it making them feel and, and is that deliberate? Is that right? And then what do I want them to do? Um, again, email is an action channel. So typically it's asking you to do something next. So whether that's click on the link to find out more or read more, whether it's to download, whether it's to consider attending or, or reviewing in some way. Actually, how do I make sure that I'm really clear and focused around what I'm going to do? And that's we kind of start to move into kind of email optimization and the difference between that and maybe kind of long form or blog creating or web creating, but actually having those fundamentals in place and thinking about it in that way just helps you get started. And then you can start to think about actually, am I doing this in, in the best way possible to get a result from the email approach? Mm. And one of the big barriers to, to getting started can just be like the, the decision theory, right? There's like a thousand email marketing providers, right? You got it so many under the sun um how important is that platform or crm or is it just about picking one and going for it yeah i think if you're starting out it's probably less important than not um i'd say the kind of key differentiations between the platform are um for a lot of smaller businesses um they're trying to combine their crm platform and their email platform together now they're doing two very different jobs the crm platform is about the data management, it's a place to put your data about recognizing um, the profile of each of those records. So whether you're doing lead scoring in terms of uh, profiling that way or whether you're doing, I have to understand you know, where the stage is for each of these customers and what they bought, etc. So there's the data side, which then has an email that bolts on. So you typically find that the functions of that kind of email part are more limited. So have a look at it and go, what do I need? Do I need to be able to pull the data in a certain way? Do I need to automate the data in a certain way or automate my sends in a certain way? How comfortable am I with putting content together? Um, because each of those kind of key functions will then help you decide how much you need or don't need the platform to support you as you go. The flip side of that is you get an email specific platform, um, which will be really, normally really uh, strong. 
in terms of actually being able to put a template together, the design of it, does it uh, render well in mobile? Is it good in dark mode? All very sexy stuff that we talk about in email, um, but may not be quite so good on the, on the data side from a CRM point of view. It'll have the data, but you might need a bit of integration. So um, it, there are you know lots of ways that you can start to kind of just break down what those needs are, like any platform scope. Fundamentally, no tool is going to do the job for you. It's going to enable that job. So you need to be really clear about what you need the job to be, and then you can fit the right solution around it. Mm. And before we get into some more like practical advice, because like, I really want to do that, like, <coughs> like, one of the big things that we really try to do on on building is move away from like that top line theory and getting to like really practical tips. But before we get into that, um, putting yourself in, like like thinking of the clients that you've you've dealt with and things like and obviously the campaigns that you've worked on as well what are the common mistakes you see business businesses and business owners making when it comes to email marketing yeah so the the um, the key ones i would say is um first of all not having a clear objective as to what you want that um send to do or maybe even that campaign to do so i've just put some stuff together i've thrown it against the wall and let's see if it sticks Again, that's not necessarily specific to email, but the power of email is that you can specifically choose who to send to, you specifically choose the version of that content they see, and you specifically choose when they receive that. The difficulty with email is that you've got to know exactly who you're going to send it to, what you're going to send to, and when you're going to send it. So that's really why email surfaces much quicker, where your strategy and your planning and your marketing approach uh, is weaker rather than stronger because you don't have the safety net of a social platform going, send this to 60-year-old Martians that live somewhere that love bikes. You you, you don't you have to know specifically how you're going to do that. Um, so that's kind of part one is in terms of kind of what's a clear objective because that sets everything from message, tone of voice, call to action, approach, uh, frequency, etc. The second one that I would say is that um, they don't create for a mobile view. So um, in the same way that most websites now have the majority of mobile views, email, the you know, unless it's very specific to a sector, and again, it's one of the things to kind of watch out for, but on the whole, mobile is the majority view for email, and actually when you compare, but most people still build on a desktop in some way, so making sure that it's optimized, and again, content length is a simple one. It doesn't look too bad when you're kind of on a full width laptop. You put that into a mobile scroll and suddenly you've got a very long email very quickly. So being aware of that uh, for a number of reasons is important. Um, and then the third one, uh, and again, not necessarily maybe email specific, but not looking at the results, not looking at the, the success or failure of previous campaigns to then test, learn and optimize into the future. And you just get into this rinse and repeat of, okay, I've set my newsletter up, I'm gonna just uh, copy and paste some new stuff and send it, copy and paste some new stuff and send it. And so you never learn, grow, optimize that channel. And I absolutely get it, Every, you know, everyone is so busy just getting the next thing out the door, everyone has got a million plates to spin, but why not optimize, maximize the effort you've put into sending it the first time to make it better and better and better. And that's, again, that's how you start to get to great emails by actually fine tuning it to really kind of hit the sweet spots for your subscriber. We're trying to build the building community. We know that in terms of like broader listenership, it's gonna take a while for that to build. We're finding shorts and the short form content is working well at getting people to at least interact, see the brand, see who we are. But on the other end of that, we've had, what, we're episode 44, I think this is gonna be. Um, so that's at least probably half of those are guest episodes. So 20 to 25 great guests on all in very similar stages or in the process of building something. So there is a shared interest, even if like broadly speaking, they're incredibly different, different people. There's a, there's a broad interest there. One of the things that we'd been speaking about is maybe we could start like a building newsletter for the guests, which is bring them on. Like maybe it's like a, a free things in three minutes where we talk one marketing thing, one thing that we found interesting in the day and then maybe one broader piece of content or a highlight of the podcast that's coming up that week. So I thought maybe we could just spitball some ideas of we've got an incredibly micro niche audience there. Do you believe we could add value to them 
from email, even if it's not that mass market, like broad sending approach. I, I love the idea of that kind of follow up from it. Um, I love the idea that actually as a guest, you become uh, part of a community or a, or a tribe for mm. one of a better phrase. The key considerations um, going back to our kind of email principles are what's the objective and what's in it. Well, actually, we didn't cover that, but actually what's the objective, but also what's in it for the reader mm -hmm. and how easy are we making that for them? So because you've got uh, a, a range of people who would be including that because it's different stages, different owners, etc. I think um, that sense of community is a thing that would really come through. But you've got to make sure that there's something in it for everyone most of the time. Uh, but it will, it could work. Uh, so I think it's you know maybe something that's that you have a formula that says okay this is the topic that was covered. So we're keeping everyone up to date who's ever been involved with our uh, ongoing journey. Because again, the great thing about email is it allows you to deliver that promotion straight to the individual rather than them having to go and find it or see it on a LinkedIn feed or come to the website to see what the next episodes are. So you're putting it in front of them and going, this is what we're talking about. But then pulling out something around that kind of mindset or business solution. So it might be, you know, everyone's top fail or everyone's uh, key bit of information, that, um, advice that was given to them or three things that they want to do next or three places that they go to network or find advice or research. So something that's broad enough that everyone who's running, owning, involved in a SME is likely to have on their radar at some point um, and actually then gives them something, a reason to mm. read week in or month in each time to, to kind of make that worthwhile. Um, but I could definitely see it kind yeah. of working as that sense of community because that's that's effectively yeah. what you're doing. You're growing. I'm going to throw an idea out here, which is probably terrible, but I'm going to go for it anyway. So one of the big things that we struggle with as well is we get a guest on the podcast. One of the big things that would really help those episodes go out is like the cross promotion, right? So we promote it, but ideally we'd like the guest to promote the episode as well because then obviously you are cross pollinating different audience groups. But that part has actually proved harder than getting people on the podcast, which is interesting as a learning. But I wonder if one of the things that we could do is we could start like a leaderboard that we track like whose episodes are getting the most plays. So, okay, cool. So, Stephen, you've had like 100 downloads. Like, Nick, you've had like 150. And like make a little bit of a competitive element there as well. So, they're, like, you're encouraging the behaviors that you, you want to see as well, but in a fun, lighthearted way. Yeah, I, I don't think that'll be fun or lighthearted. Oh, really? I think that will become aggressively competitive very quickly and there's nothing wrong with that That's yeah fine. no there is a place for gamification for sure i'm curious do you know why because that that seems strange to me so as a marketeer as a consultant as somebody who's putting time and effort into appearing on the podcast why wouldn't you also then want to be able to get the halo effect and the share of audience from mm. that so what's your best guess as to why people aren't doing that so one of the things actually so george has put this on my radar to start doing this week well next week now is asking so following up about hey like we've noticed you haven't shared x y z like can we just get some feedback as to what the barriers are i think in some cases it is just really busy i've done the recording i know i need to get it out but i've also got these one other you know these other hundred things on my to-do list and it just always falls down the, the the pile a little bit could be one um i think potentially we could do a better job of like following up a couple of days later and be like do you remember some highlights of things that you spoke about if you do we'll get them clipped up for you so there's not just clips that we've generated but there's clips that the guest has asked for as well um but yeah like you said they are best guesses so one yeah. of the things that we want to do is just go back through and ask the question like why is that because then if we can get a real understanding of it hopefully we can cover that off in the like the pre-work rather than having to do that in the, yeah. in the post and it might be that if if time and effort is the key blocker, which I can absolutely understand, then what ways can you make that as easy as possible? So whether that's effectively a, a template speaker tile or whether it's a, uh, you know, giving them back two or three quotes so they don't have to remember it or assess it and go, if you just mm. want to drop that into a LinkedIn post, here's the hashtag or the link that you might want to use. So almost like a template of an asset that goes you don't have to think about it 
you know, almost, or even if you're happy for this to go, we can kind of create it for you and then you've just got to send it. Again, what's how can you reduce as much friction as possible? Take your own SEO learnings, yeah. you know, all of that in terms of if we want an action, we need to make it easy and then see if that kind of uh, helps in some way. I said, yeah, I love that idea. I think that's something that we could easily do. Like you see it if like someone's speaking at a conference or whatever, or like like I know obviously you're doing the, the market meet up in Milton Keynes now. You send out those assets and things yep. like that to make that promotion easier. I think there's a really good reframe on why email marketing is so important and so powerful as well. And I think it's on your point about um, like having that safety net of the, the social platforms is it's probably the only form of marketing that people have to opt into rather than just getting interrupted by, right? Like someone has to commit a an action to get into your database, whether that be they've bought something and then they've checked the box to say, yeah, I'm happy for you to email us again, or they've just signed up to your newsletter or your emails for like a di- whatever it may be, they've got into your database, but they've done that by committing an action. So that they're already a level more qualified than anybody else that you could, could reach. And I think, understanding that and placing that importance on it it shouldn't be paralyzing it should be motivational in the sense like why would i not go to these people first these people are clearly more engaged than someone i might disrupt yeah via via an ad but yeah let's go into the the more practical advice um and appreciate that obviously some of these questions they're going to differ business by business but let's try and tackle them the best we can um at what stage, what well, two-part question, at what stage should you start doing data segmentation and how do you, like, what should you be segmenting your data on? I would say look look at your life stage, so uh, as, a, as a first step. So you can segment really simply uh, against are they a prospect or are they a customer? And again, those basics of what do I, as a, as a subscriber, what do I need to know? What's most important to me? What are my considerations, my needs, my wants, my fears? All the things that we do around that kind of persona and profiling work really can kind of come through an email because you can talk to that directly. So as soon as you're, you have enough volume to warrant it, and again, that's a, there's no right and wrong on that. It's about time, effort, resource, and kind of outcome. Start to at least divide up against that. Um, and then ideally start to understand those different uh, categories that you've got of customer, um, you know, who's buying what or who's using what and what's the next best step for them um, and start to try and at least tailor and personalize. So even if you're not segmenting by having different audience groups, you might want to tailor and personalize by at least uh, referencing a particular product or a particular service within the send that you're mm-hmm. um, creating. What about A-B testing? I think it's something that you, you hear a lot. If you started to Google email marketing and you're trying to get into it a little bit more, one of the first things that's going to come up is is the principle of, of A-B testing. Um, so let's take it a level deeper than like, what is A-B testing? And like, like what should people be A-B testing in their emails? Yeah, great question. It's the ambition that everyone has. They know they should be testing. It is one of the first things that isn't done because people are too busy. It's that and uh, the reporting review. They're the two things that go out the window straight away. Everyone starts with subject line because it's the easiest thing to do. Um, There's a great piece of research. It came out in 2011 from Marketing Sherpa uh, about things that uh, tests that are most frequently carried out and tests that have the most impact. Subject line was like a 70% uh, frequency of testing. Uh, makes a difference in 30% of the cases. So there is absolutely a place for subject line testing. What I would say is have a think about what's going to make the biggest difference quicker. So come back to your point of we're all slightly impatient. We all want to see the difference. So things like your call to action button placement, the color, the copy wording, long versus short, uh, lots of images versus no images. Go with the big stuff because that's the stuff that's going to make the difference and then iterate and fine tune your tone of voice or your subject line. Um, The other big thing that very rarely gets tested is landing page. So actually coming away from the email itself, but the next step, uh, you know, consider your email as part of a journey. Um, So uh, I think tested in about 30% of the cases makes a difference in about 40%. So that would be my top tip is have a think about your landing page as well. Um, most places just drop you, certainly if you're kind of e-commerce, drop you into a product page. If your email is a promotion, 
most software will allow you to create a bespoke landing page. So create something that mirrors the content of the email. Again, just focuses, the, you know, it can have the benefits, the value, and then that next call to action into the product as they kind of, as you nurture them through rather than uh, that smack in the face of going, click, buy, uh, n no. You know, so. Mentioned clicks a lot there. Um, and obviously the focus definitely over the last few years with various different uh, updates, legislation, and obviously I think just better understanding of how consumers behave as well, is the focus is definitely moving away from open rate. Like when I, so I started my career like 10 years ago in, in email marketing and the big thing we used to report on was just like, where are we at of open rate? What's the benchmark across the industry? Are we improving above that? And the focus is obviously now moving more down towards the, the, the action. So clicks are becoming more and more important. How do you improve the click rate within an email? Yeah, so the, the reason, just to kind of come back to why Open has shifted specific to email, was the introduction of uh, mail privacy policy from Apple for the iOS 15. So that's uh, September 19, I think. It was a couple of years ago now. Uh, time flies when you're having <laughs> email fun. Um, and what that effectively <laughs> did uh, was it starts to protect the subscriber uh, by... Um, uh, the tracking pixels um, being cached by Apple themselves so that uh, an individual can't be, uh, their, their actions can't be seen. And what that did is it gave a series of kind of false positives so in, it inflated the open rate because everything looked like it had been opened rather than not. Now, it wasn't quite as Armageddon uh, as the email industry had thought. Um, it typically looks like the opens are only cached 24 hours afterwards so and a lot of interaction happens in that first 24 hours on email but what it did is it made the industry just go how important is open versus action and that's where click kind of comes in in terms of actually interacting with it is the key part so to improve clicks come back to your actual question um yeah so there's a couple of things one is to make it as easy as possible for somebody to interact with your email so where is the first place that somebody can actually interact? So if you've got a nice big hero image, uh, a load of intro text, uh, a secondary story, and then a call to action click button at the bottom of the email, again, take your mobile view, you're making somebody scroll all the way to the bottom before they can actually interact. So look at putting a call to action button somewhere near the top. If somebody sees the subject line, so they got context, they've opened it up, yes, this is what I was looking for, this is right, how easy can you make for them to click as soon as possible? Um, make sure that those clicks are clearly definable. So again, um, use buttons ideally rather than necessarily copy links. There is absolutely a place for copy links, but don't make that your primary way of being able to just draw the attention to the clickable area. Again, from an accessibility and mobile view, make sure that those clicks are nice thumb sized rather than small and difficult. Um, and then the last part is you know, we come back to our testing, actually test it. What's the you know, the best uh, color approach? Uh, copywriting, do you want a nice intriguing call to action? Do you want a straightforward? Uh, my other advice is avoid passive. So lots of kind of find out more, read more, click here. It doesn't really help. So actually inspire, intrigue, directness, benefit driven, all of those kind of key copy creation techniques that we teach and, and adopt, use those for your call to action buttons as much as you would for any other copy you're creating. Yeah, it's like if we take it back for great email, for email to be even good, it's got to get into people's inboxes. And that obviously from an email perspective, we'd call it deliverability. So how do business owners ensure that their emails end up in people's inbox and not in spam folders? Yeah. So I'm aware that in this uh, podcast so far, we've not done a lot of laughing. We've got a very serious conversation about email, and this is not going to help in any way, <laughs> but we'll we'll give it a go. So there's uh, two areas to look at. One is the technical side, and then one is based on reputation. From a technical side, um, it's more about just making sure that you've set up your email authentication correctly. So there's various... Uh, elements in setup. Um, so there's an SPF record, there's a DKIM, a DMARC. Um, I'm aware that readers or listeners are already turning off, so we won't go any further, <laughs> but just make sure that either you are somebody or that you've looked at that in terms of the technical setup. And then by far the kind of, probably the biggest difference now uh, is on uh, reputation. So each of the email inbox providers 
will look at how somebody's interacting with your emails uh, over time. So they'll recognize the IP it's being sent from, they'll recognize the domain, they'll put that together. So if you, for example, you know, Apple and Gmail are probably between them have got 70% of the email traffic, it's really easy for them now to say, okay, I recognize you as a sender. I can then start to see who's opening, who's clicking, who's marking it, uh, putting it into spam, who's taking it out of spam, who's forwarding those emails. So all of those metrics, which we don't necessarily see as marketeers, are being used to create a reputation. Um, think of that like a credit score. So the higher your credit score, the more likely you are to be able to get credit. For email, the higher your reputation, the more likely you are to end up uh, both uh, to be received in the inbox, uh, in, in so the email as at all, and then actually into the inbox as a second stage. And there is this slight so deliverability that we can all see from our email metrics just tells us whether it was successfully deployed and it didn't bounce because it failed in some way. There is a deliverability is actually the difference between being received into the mailbox and actually being placed into the inbox. And that's the that's where mm. working on your reputation, working on that uh, engagement really helps. That reputation, do you have to like build it up over time? Yeah, uh, fundamentally. So um, there are a number of ways you can make it stronger. Um, what typically tends to happen is that you lose reputation rather than gaining reputation. So as a new sender, um, as long as you've kind of, there's, you warm your IP is the phrase, or if you're using a smaller platform, you're probably on a shared IP, which means you get the benefit of other users' reputations as a start. Mm. Um, it's the malpractice that will tend to erode that. So if you're high volume, so if you think of yourself, what they're trying to do is, are you a spammer? And spamming behavior typically is high volume, infrequent, um, and uh, irrelevant in some way. So if you have a regular volume, a uh, regular cadence, which is again, is where newsletters help, it's where your drip feed campaigns kind of help, that will all then help uh, maintain and uh, build your reputation. Mm. So I saw this one uh, in, a, in a group that I'm in on, uh, on a school community, and it was a really interesting take. So when I used to do talks on email, one of the big things that I was always going with is about like data cleansing and removing people or like sending to them less frequently um but normally with the objective of if they're not engaged and they've shown no signs of being engaged let's let's get them out let's get them out there get, out, get them out of there um so joe davies founder of fat joe his point was besides cost like why would you want to remove people from a database um reputation is a big factor within that um so I think we need to be cautious that what we're not necessarily saying is uh, I've sent three times, they've not responded, uh, get rid of them. Uh, so we need to put this in a kind of context of your business as well. So if your typical purchase cycle, repeat cycle is three years, let's say you're a holiday company, um, how can you measure engagement uh, full stop? So it m it, there'll be part of it in terms of are they engaging with email as a channel? Are they opening and clicking? They'll be part of it in terms of have they come back to their website and ideally if you can link website traffic to your subscriber base that's a bit more advanced but it's absolutely doable um that kind of helps you um have i seen them transact in some way so um so although the temptation is just look at email i would say take a more holistic view of your subscriber and their actions before you make those decisions but fundamentally, if somebody is not interacting with your email for a length of time, and uh, you know you can make that 13 months, you can make it two years, that's fine. At some point, you are better off removing them, or at least, tr so two things. One, um, put them into a lapsed journey. So there's a bit of a pattern interrupt. There's a specific journey. You start to treat these people differently, different subject lines, perhaps a more aggressive offer. Mm -hmm. um, so I was head of ECRM for Travelodge for three years. Uh, they're a very heavy trading company. They're all about the numbers. So if you're trying to create a promotion, the uh, trading team are like, well, I'm not going to give away my profitability. So no. But actually, when you come to them and say, these people haven't purchased, uh, aren't interacting with our channel, we want to up the promotion on it because anything you're getting from them is incremental and therefore the business case suddenly stacks up nice and easy. So it's a slight aside, but linking your kind of life stage and your segments with your business case 
really helps with getting sign off if you if you're not the person that is mm. deploying and budgeting at the same time um so that in a part means that uh you will if you've gone through lapsing if they're really just not engaged at all then um from a deliverability and a reputation point of view that's the things that the email inbox provider will be looking at and if that's too high or too consistent will start to damage your reputation, which means that then you'll start to risk not being able to hit the inbox at all for any of your traffic. And all of that time, effort, and the power of your email starts to diminish. Um, and therefore, that's you know, probably the biggest reason that you want to just look after your data hygiene uh, mm. in that way. Yeah, I love those like disruptor emails, the ones that we use all the time with like, the, do you still want to hear from us? Yeah. Like, that fear of missing out suddenly yeah. goes through the roof and you get people back in, even if it's for a couple of months. But like you say, it gives you a chance to fire off an offer in there or something like that. Might get a little bit of incremental growth, even if they then drop out again, you've got something. For yeah, that. and it doesn't have to be single step. So quite often people go, well, I've sent one, you know, what, you know we miss you, classically. Um, but actually make it a journey. So, you know, uh, recognising, you know, what are the benefits of receiving email? So you get the latest news, latest mm. offers direct to you. Send a bit of a survey, you know, what what do you think about us? Or is there a reason that you know, the emails aren't hitting the mark? maybe a bit of a competition and then a final, you know, a do not resuscitate. Actually, if you really don't want to hear from us, then don't click the button effectively. Yeah. And that's the, a, a mixture of FOMO, but a very clear kind of, right, I know what's going to happen. Yeah, just from yeah, the, uh, the guys at Gymshark got me with this the other day, actually. They sent me an email that was like, it's been 12 months since you bought from us, here's 30% off. And I was like, straight in, yeah. there we go. There so go. it does work. Like normally when I, we speak to people about like ads or whatever, I'm like, nah, that doesn't, doesn't work on me. And yeah. that one happened. I was like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's all the things. It was completely relevant because you recognize yourself straight away. Yeah. The timing was in terms of, well, they've created a need in the thing and they've put an attractive offer in. So, you know, it's yeah. all those bits of the puzzle that come together, which is great marketing. Mm. And you gave me a beautiful segue. So one of the things that we wanted to say, one of the things we wanted You're to welcome. speak about was uh, yeah you haven't seen these either and it was perfectly timed. So on LinkedIn um, and now as well you talk about the success you had with Travelodge. I think it was 100% revenue growth year on year. Yeah. Um, obviously we could spend a whole podcast on that, but like let's go give us the like highlights. How did you achieve that? Yeah. So it was uh, um, three or four streams that I kind of worked on to do that um, for their campaign sense. Um, there was a mixture of uh, test, learn, optimize. So uh, I'm very happy to say that I practice what I preach. Uh, nobody follows their own advice. I was having that conversation <laughs> just earlier. Um, so we, uh, as a team, start to look at uh, A-B testing. We start to look at increased personalization. So uh, we introduced a preference center, which allowed us to understand uh, people's reasons for travel. Um, we tested a shift in positioning from uh, it's not about booking the room, it's about the reason that you're traveling and looking at kind of destination content approach. So a number of different pieces from a content point of view that we looked at to try and optimize that. And we also brought in uh, Frazy. Uh, so that's an AI. Uh, now, this is probably mm, uh, six, seven years ago. So... Yeah, for those that are only just hearing about AI, AI has been around for a long time um, and has been helping for a long time. It's just it's come to the fore mm. uh, in the last uh, year or so. Um, but effectively, that uh, took success uh, for all your past metric success and then using a, um, a language model would then help uh, optimize your subject lines. And that, that had crazy impact in terms of uh, actually increasing engagement from that point of view. Um, all sorts of fascinating stuff and the fact that you don't read in a linear word for word word you pick out patterns and so it would it would give you uh, subject lines that you would never create yourself that you would never be brave enough to create but because you do a uh, test first in terms of you send out uh, nine subject lines and one human created subject line to 20 percent of your base it then means that you can see the data before you send on that winning subject line to everyone else so uh, again, as a quick aside, we had um, a cat emoji uh, in a subject line with capitalization kind of midway. We knew the brand team would never sign that off. So we took it to the brand team and said, this has just won this test. We've seen a 30% uh, uplift in open rate, a 7% uplift in conversion. 
are you happy that we send it to everyone else? Because the data doesn't lie, it's very difficult to say no to that because you've got to be a really brave person to go, I'm going to ignore all that data and just do it the way that we think we should do it. Um, so yeah, so a bit of kind of technical, a bit of content. The other two things that we did were um, uh, create a set of uh, automated sends. So again, coming back to that live stage, um, we developed the basket and browse abandon sends uh, we had um, some shoulder night promotions. So if we recognized that somebody had booked for a single night on a Monday for their business travelers, we'd then send out a promotion for a Sunday night, make it easy, et cetera, et cetera. So again, benefit driven, but um, trigger based. Um, that had a real kind of impact on that kind of revenue line. Those those drip feed campaigns mm. really work because they're really timely and very targeted. And then the last thing we did, which is a bit of a longer piece, was uh, a segmentation piece um, using recency, frequency, and monetary value as the model, which gave us some rolling segments across never booked, booked once, uh, high value, low frequency, high frequency, low value, so that we could then start to be really tailored with some of those groups. So, for example, our high frequency, low value tend to be offer driven. They will only book if there is an offer. So rather than trying to change their behavior, actually take that specific group and increase the frequency of the offers to get the revenue, but without then candidalizing the profitability of your uh, non-offer bookers because you're not offering mm. to everyone all the time. So again, just being able to get really more targeted about what you're doing. And those that combination of activity then allowed that last click uplift year on year. Yeah, I think you get like, the, the, I think the great tip in there is the simple <coughs> one around... Um, preference centers like we saw it time and time again we used to work with jewelers and auctioneers and things like that and just understanding is it watches is it rings is it ear like what is it that you're genuinely interested in because then we can tailor the emails to that and i guess even top line for for that would be are you a business traveler or are you traveling for leisure or whatever it may be because like you say the, the booking rates there are going to be dramatically different you're probably going on a holiday you know maybe once a quarter once a year Whereas if you're traveling for business, that could could happen every week. And then yeah. it allows you to tailor those messages very specifically. Yeah. So it's, it, it's a mixture of that, but it's also then the psychology mm. uh, behind it. So as a leisure booker, you typically, um, especially if you're kind of family based as well, uh, the times that you can book are very limited, which is why you have mm. to pay the premium. But the things that are important to you are uh, cleanliness, uh, food options, what's happening in the in the location as a business traveler you've maybe not flexibility on time but your booking window is much shorter you're yeah. you know probably booking a couple of weeks out rather than months out but your key considerations there are wi-fi car parking ability to invoice you know early breakfast early checkout so again you come back to all things to all people if you send that kind of mix of messages to your subscribers it's going to hit the mark sometimes, but it's not going to hit the mark all the time. Whereas if you know which group of messages are most mm. important to that group, and I realize this is segmentation 101. Yeah. But again, because email means that you can recognize per subscriber, per individual. And I love your comment about it's people, it's not data. I absolutely concur with that. Keep thinking about it as people, not data. What's the important thing to that individual? Because I can still send the same template. I can still put the 80% of the effort in, but the key message or the key image or the key call to action can just flip out and flip in for each of those subscribers. And I can automate that ideally. And therefore, effort, time, resource becomes much more efficient. Mm. So let's get the crystal ball out to finish. Um, let's think 25, 26, 27, however far ahead you want to go. If you've got a business owner looking to stay ahead in email marketing, where should they be focusing their efforts? I would say get the basics right. I and and I know it's a slightly rubbish answer because it's not exciting. It's the, it's not shiny new thing. Um, and we will talk about AI. I will absolutely bring it in because it's clearly we can't do a marketing conversation without AI in any way. But get those basics right. So from your kind of data hygiene, your segmentation, know your customer, be able to be uh, tailored and personalized to them. What are all the things that you respond to as an individual? Put yourself in the shoes of the customer, get that right, and you will be better than 70% of the emails that are going out today. And therefore you will differentiate by just doing the basics right. 
And then on top of that, if you can then start to automate that, so whether that's automated journeys, whether it's automated personalization, that means you've got less effort for a greater return. Um, and I think that's where AI will start to kind of come in and help. So in terms of being able to less time thinking about what I'm gonna write and more time being able to polish that to uh, rehumanize it, to then put the humor, the entertainment, the education in, I think that's where uh, that's where I really see you know one of the great ways that AI is going to help. I think all marketers, in terms of um, I can speed up the basics, which means I've got time left because I still only have a finite number of hours to really polish this and hone it, rather than it's not wrong and therefore I'm just going to send it because I've run out of time. Mm. And I think that I love the taking it back to basics. I think we talk about a lot just thinking about the principles that are going to stand the test of time. If you want to survive in the future, what are the things that are still going to be around in the future? Place your bets on those rather than trying to find the new shiny thing. And one of the things that I haven't seen many people do that we used to do quite a lot is we'd create a separate inbox um, specifically for to a point competitor analysis, but trying to get our, our minds in the, the head of our potential customers and be like, what other emails do we think they're going to be receiving? Subscribe to our own emails as well. And then you're really going to start to get an idea of like what are people's inboxes looking like? How are we standing out? Because while obviously like an ad you're vying against thousands, you're probably only vying against maybe hundreds, even less than that, maybe in the fifties or, or tens in terms of brands that that person is subscribed to. But understanding everything that they're going to be seeing, I think is quite powerful because it allows you to then start to test things based on standing out on what you're already seeing. Yeah, no, I'm a big advocate of competitor research in some way. And again, I agree completely because you're not only vying against your competitors, you're vying against a share of attention. Mm. So, you know, look at similar emails in your demographic or your area, those complementary businesses. So if you're a bank, look at your insurance. If you're uh, an e-commerce, look at the other sectors that are doing that because all of that is gonna be vying for attention. You will learn a hell of a lot. You will look at bits and go, oh, I love that. So you can, let's not call it steal, let's call it be inspired by. Mm. There'll be bits that you see and you go, oh, you know what, I've had five sales messages in four days. Let's not do that because even it's making me feel a bit ick. So all of that is kind of really good. The other thing that a lot of uh, businesses don't do is to ask your subscribers. So you can quite easily put a kind of thumbs up, thumbs down on email, did you like this? That will give you that moment in time. But actually take somebody who's had your emails for the last six months or a year and send them a really short incentivized survey that says, have you ever thought you might want to unsubscribe? What's the frequency like of what we send you? What uh, expectations do we set from our subject line? How well do you understand what you're going to reach when you click on a button? And use that kind of first party research to help open up those blind spots. Um, I used to do a lot for kind of web UX and I love those golden nugget moments where you think something's really easy to do or you suddenly get an insight into how somebody starts mm. to prepare to do their research to complete a task. All of that can only help you kind of get better. Yeah, a uh, uh, good on that, like a letter from the CEO and things like that always work quite nicely. And then like in a, hey, can you do this for us? Do us a favor. They they work very nicely. Let's uh, let's round us out with some quick fire questions. So hopefully less taxing, less, <laughs> less, less email focused, yeah. a more light hearted. So let's go for it. Um, What's the best bit of business advice you've ever received? Uh, so I would say it is um, get to 80% and go. Uh, clearly, it can't be wrong, but that's the benefit and the return that you'll get from spending the next 100% of your time getting that extra 20% is not going to be worth it. So it removes the procrastination. It removes that sense of uh, doubt just do it, get out there, and then iterate and learn is, uh, it works. Again, gives me a lovely segue. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite failure of yours? Uh, yes, yes, I do. I've, I've got a couple maybe, and actually one of them is kind of relevant to the, uh, to, the, to the group in the room. So I have suddenly realized that when I put my website together, eight years ago, and it hasn't been refreshed since because nobody follows their own advice. Uh, I didn't think about SEO at all. I thought about what's the shop front for the business? What do I need to describe? Uh, I don't even have a page that says uh, email expert on it. It's crazy. So uh, so that's 
in hindsight, not looking at SEO because I wasn't as aware of it as I am now uh, was was that. Um, uh, and then I guess on a, a more kind of personal level, um, uh, it would actually be uh, looking at something for so long in a subject line and still not spotting the spelling mistake and then sending it out to 2.5 million people. Yeah, nobody died. You know, you know email is not uh, brain surgery, but you kind of go, how, how have I missed that? It wasn't only me. You know, there were mm. other people peer reviewing, but you just go, really? So, uh, yeah, it's it's the sweat that everyone who presses send on an email always feels. Good. Yeah, it's that, yeah. I, it's the one residing feeling like I have whenever I think back to my early days. It's that, yeah, that pre-set, that, well, pre and post-send anxiety. It's like, you've checked it a million times. You're sure it's fine. You get the email yourself, go to check it, and you're like, how have I missed that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if you only had two hours a day to work on your business, what would you do? Yeah, I love this question. Uh, I do. It has had made it has made me think. Uh, but I, I would say if you've only got the, the most important thing you can do, well, I, it, do, it will depend on kind of what stage your business is at, but I would say that actually use it to talk to people. There is a lot of time spent creating content. There is a lot of time spent uh, polishing and kind of thinking. Actually just have the conversation. So whether you're networking, whether you're just saying yes to opportunities to come on a podcast, just do the stuff that allows you to talk to people and uh, not even directly your audience straight away, but that will reach your audience eventually. And I think that's that's the thing that really makes a difference. That's the thing that keeps the wheels turning. That's the thing that keeps the lights on in the end is making sure that your message is out there as much as it can be. Hmm. And then final question. Um, what's the one thing you want people to take away from the last hour? So I have a mantra within twist uh, which is the consultancy uh, which is that relevance engages and engagement converts and all the things that we've spoken about be it your data approach be it putting those thinking about your campaigns the objectives thinking about your audience all of that is about being relevant and therefore getting the success from what you're doing otherwise there's no point and you know again put your consumer hat back on if i receive this in the shoes of that customer group is it likely to resonate with them? And that might be because the topic's right. It might be because the timing's right. It might just be because you're entertaining. And, and there's nothing wrong with just making people laugh or smile or cry and being relevant that way. But do something that's going to make a difference and therefore it becomes worthwhile. Hmm. Perfect. And that's it. We're done.